most of us hopefully know about the blessings that come from being part of a family. When we're part of a family, usually it means we have someone to talk to and a listening ear for us when we need it. It means there's someone to help us when our car breaks down. It means there's someone there to encourage us when we're having troubles at work. It means that we have a place to belong and to feel accepted. A place and a group of people that love us unconditionally. While those are descriptions of a physical family that most of us hopefully have enjoyed and been part of and, in, and know what it's like to be part of a physical family, here in this passage in 1 Peter, he's describing for us what it's like to be part of a spiritual family and the family of God. And we have to sometimes ask ourselves, what does it mean to be born into God's spiritual family? What did it take for us to be adopted into his spiritual family? What is our role or our place in that family and what are we supposed to do? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25 that Georgine read for us answers some of those questions about what life is like within the spiritual family of God. And 1 Peter, as we're going to start to find out as we go through it in these coming weeks, is a unique book, not just based on the content of what's in there, but the, the commands that Peter gives to believers. See, a lot of New Testament books, these letters that we have in our Bible, we could easily divide, like Ephesians, the first three chapters are doctrine, and then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are all practical things we're told to do. Romans, the first 11 chapters are all doctrine, and then chapters 12 through 16 are things we're told to do. In Galatians, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 are history and theology, and then chapters 5 and 6 are things we're told to do. But Peter doesn't really follow that format. He starts out with commands right from the beginning. Every paragraph in the book of Peter begins with a command except for chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 2, verse 4. Every paragraph has a command. It's almost like reading Morris code with the dots and dashes as we go through Peter's letters. He says, do this, do this, do this, do this. And we start to see that today as we're looking at this passage. So you'll notice if you have an outline there, a, a message outline, I'm pretty much just following the paragraph divisions there. We're going to look at this holy living that we are born again into. We'll look at the holy sacrifice that allowed us to be adopted into God's family. And then the holy word that was preached to us. And this holy living is how Peter starts out here in verses 13 through 16. He writes, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now we notice three of these commands that Peter gives right here in verse three, 13, as we read about the present actions he wants us to have. That first present action is there where he says, prepare your minds for action. <clears throat> a literal way to translate this, maybe if you have a Bible that has footnotes, a literal way to translate this would be, gird up the loins of your mind. It sounds a little unique, but the image there is men in that New Testament time would often wear clothing that would kind of look like a robe or a longer dress, and they would gird up their loins, meaning they'd take that longer robe and they'd pull it up and then they'd tuck it into their belt so that they could run or walk quickly unhindered. That's the image he has here for these New Testament readers. It's a metaphorical way of telling them to monitor their thought process, to be disciplined in their thinking, and to reject all the hindrances of the world or the things that might trip them up. A second thing Peter commands them to do is to be sober in spirit there in verse 13. The idea here is of self-control, steadfastness, clarity of mind, and being morally decisive. 
that we should focus our priorities on God and not be taken away by the things of the world, not be intoxicated and, and drawn away and diluted into the things of the world. And then a third command he has there is he says, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you. In light of the suffering that Peter has just introduced in chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, he tells them to fix their hope on Jesus and, and to be ready when Jesus returns. So he gives them these three present actions and then describes them how they should put off the old self that used to be part of their lives in verse 14. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. And we see here a beginning of this family metaphor that Peter starts to give us throughout this passage here. He calls them as obedient children, he says in verse 14. Then in verse 15, he references how God called them into the family. Then in verse 17, he talks about how these people address God as their father. Then in verse 18, he talks about how they've been redeemed into this spiritual family. And then back, back down in verse 23, he references them being born again into this spiritual family. These are all pictures of the, the family of God, and Scripture teaches us that we've been adopted into God's family when we place our faith in Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, it says, You have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we are part of God's family when we place our faith in Jesus. We get adopted into his family. And Peter is telling them that you're part of God's family and this is your place within God's family to do these things. And he gives them one more thing in verses 15 and 16 about practicing this new life. He says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. See, part of being a member of a family is the kids usually start to act like the parent without even realizing that. We've all learned that as we grow older. And if our parent is our heavenly father, we should be starting to act and be like him as we grow in our relationship with him. And he references there in verse 14 their past, and then he contrasts it in verse 15. He says their past in verse 14, those old lusts, but in verse 15, <clears throat> act like the holy one who called you. The holy one God is our model that we follow. And he gives us the manner here. He says, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Four times Peter talks to these people about being holy in just two verses. And that word holy means to be set apart, to be separated for God from the world. And see, holiness should distinguish us as believers. We should look different than the world that we live around. It means we don't do drugs that are illicit and illegal. It means we don't cuss all the time in our language. It means we don't drink alcohol from morning till evening. It means we pay our bills on time, that we work and do a good job and we are honest in how we address things. It means we, we save certain things for marriage and we maintain good boundaries with our future spouse before marriage. Those are all things that we're supposed to do according to Scripture to set us apart. As Christians, our lives should not look like a Friends episode, if you've ever seen Friends. Funny show. They all kind of start going together and mixing and matching, and it kind of gets a little weird over time. We should be set apart and distinct and looking different. And he gives us the motivation here in verse 16. Be like the one who called you in verse 15. And then it says, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
Peter's quoting from Leviticus there, saying we should be holy just as God is holy. Craig Keener in his commentary on 1 Peter says, a life consecrated to God means a life set apart for his service. We might go to a birthday party for a family member. We might be the only one that refuses to gossip about the black sheep of the family, right? Because we're separate and we're different. We might go to a work Christmas party and we're the only one that refuses to get drunk on the free booze that's there because we're set apart and we're different. So Peter talks about this holy living in verse 1, but then he describes the price that placed us into this spiritual family. This holy sacrifice that had to be given to get us into that spiritual family. In verses 17 through 21, Peter writes, If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. But with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Again, at the beginning of this paragraph, we see another command from Peter where he talks about our reverence that we should have for God. And he says, conduct yourselves in fear. Another command at the beginning of a paragraph of what he tells us to do. Now, this fear we should have for God is not terror, but instead is reverence. It's an awe and admiration of who God is. As we develop an accurate understanding of who God is, we should respond to God in fear. My study Bible has a note here that says a sense of awe, this fear should be a sense of awe from having been struck with who God is and an alertness that results from that. So that's the reverence we should have in verse 17. And then Peter describes the ransom that was paid so that we could be part of God's family in verses 18 and 19. He says, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. When Peter describes how we are redeemed, he uses a verb that's only used three times in the New Testament that describes how we... Uh, Something is paid in order to buy it back, to free something by paying a ransom. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross for us. He He bought our lives back. But Peter makes it clear here in verse 18, it wasn't silver or gold that bought us back. Those things were valuable and costly and expensive and good for everyday life, but that's not what bought them back. Some people even think that Peter's writing to Gentiles and he's trying to subtly condemn their silver and gold cult practices and silver and gold gods that they maybe had around. Instead, it was the ransom price paid by Jesus Christ. And Peter describes how Jesus was perfect and sinless. He calls him, he describes he had a precious blood. He was unblemished. And he was spotless. The blood of Christ was spotless. And Peter uses a rhetorical alliteration here, starting all four of those words there with the Greek letter alpha. So people maybe hearing this or reading this would catch up on this this special, unique person, this special, unique Messiah, Jesus. He had precious blood. He was a lamb unblemished, and he was spotless. And that's what the Old Testament taught for those Jewish people when they brought sacrifices, the sacrifices that were meant to atone for people's sins and cleanse their guilt were supposed to be the first and the best and the perfect sacrifices they brought, not their old secondhand things. 
And Peter describes the reason for us too in verse 20. For he, which is talking about Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. Peter references how God the Father foreknew Jesus. There is this kind of active involvement and planning in the future. It's not just this passive idea that occurred in God's mind, but God foreordained that Jesus would die and be the perfect sacrifice for us. But then Peter transitions from our duty to God and our obedience to him to our duty and obedience to one another as believers in God's spiritual family. And he describes this sincere love that we should have for one another in verse 22. Peter says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. That's the sincere love that we should have for each other that Peter describes for them. And this wasn't a new command. Jesus had said this to the disciples in chapter 13 of John. He said, a commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. One of the reasons we believe the guy Peter that wrote this letter we're reading is the same guy that spent time with Jesus because there are 32 different passages in 1 Peter that closely parallel what Jesus taught. And this is one of them. Same guy that spent three years with Jesus is this Peter. And he says that they're supposed to love one another. And he describes two types of love here. In verse 22, if you've been in church for a while or listen to podcasts or sermons on the radio, you might hear people talk about the different words for love in Greek, right? The the different words for love. And here Peter talks about the sincere love of the brethren. That's Philadelphia love, the familial love, the brotherly love that sometimes they would distinguish. But then Peter pivots a little bit, and he says, fervently love one another from the heart. And there he uses agape love, which is a sacrificial, intentional, conscious, willful act of love. So have some brotherly love, but also actively do love to one another, is what he's saying. And as we read the New Testament letters that are written, obviously after Jesus has has died and ascended to heaven, a lot of New Testament authors will say you're supposed to love one another, but build and grow in that love. For example, Peter, when he writes to the Thessalonians, he says, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren, who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to still excel more. What Paul is saying there and Peter is saying here, you're doing good to love, but you need to increase in that love and love more with each other. And Christians, we should have a reputation for loving each other, right? Just as Adam had shared, and I guess Logan had shared, what a great testimony of the love they have felt from you as a church. That's how it's supposed to be. Andrew Jackson, he was our fourth, uh, seventh president of the United States, but before that, he was in charge of the Tennessee militia in a war in 1812, and he was working with these men that were camped in this area for a period of time, and the men were getting grumpy and grouchy and starting to fight with each other and bicker, and they were having problems. So there's a story about how Andrew Jackson brought these men all together in his army fighting his battle, and he said, guys, we need to remember, the enemy is over there. It's not us, but sometimes the reputation churches have and Christians have is that we are enemies with each other, right? We fight over the color of carpets, the best Bible translations, 
or the best types of worship music. But instead, we're supposed to love one another and grow in that love. So that's the sincere love we're supposed to have for one another. But Peter doesn't stop there. He continues and describes for us the source of that love in verses 23 through 25. He writes, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is though the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you, he says. That word for at the beginning of verse 23, at least in my translation, kind of gives us the explanation for what Jesus has just said in verse 22 about the sincere love we should have. It comes because we are born again into God's family. When we are part of God's family, we don't have to earn our way in that family. We don't do things to prove we are part of that family, but we do love because we are part of that family. We do love because of the relationship we already enjoy with God and with one another. And this word that he talks about is the word that's been preached to us, the gospel that we've heard that is everlasting, that doesn't fade away. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40 here, describing how the word from God does not diminish and doesn't go away, which is an interesting part of Isaiah to quote because Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 are all about the future fall and doom and desolation of Judah and Israel. But in chapter 40, Isaiah, God speaks to Isaiah and starts to give him promises of the future. And that's one of them, that in light of the earth and things on earth that might pass away, God's word endures forever. Warren Wearsby says about these, these verses, he says, While God's methods of working may change from age to age, his character remains the same, and his spiritual principles never vary. We do not study the Bible just to get to know the Bible. We study the Bible that we might get to know God better. Too many earnest Bible students are content with outlines and explanations and do not really get to know God. It is good to know the word of God, but this should help us know the God of the word. So we study God's word, not just to know what it says and means, but so that we know the God we worship better. And that takes us back to holiness. When we know God better, we can better act like we should and grow in our faith and act like God as we know him better. So as we wrap up today, most of us know what it's like to belong to a physical family that we started talking about. The amazing blessings of being in a good physical family. But Peter's describing for us what it's like to be in God's spiritual family. And that spiritual family should be marked by a, a pursuit of holiness. It's marked by a perfect sacrifice that Jesus gave to get us into the family. It's marked by pursuing love for one another that's sacrificial and sincere. And that spiritual life is marked by God's word that's given to us that we study and we rely on. That's what it means to be part of God's spiritual family. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the goodness of a place to belong. Especially for those of us that didn't come from a family where we get to enjoy unconditional acceptance. Some of us come from families where we didn't have a good father or mother to follow or emulate. But you, God, you, you give that for us. In the model of your son that sacrificed for us, in the model of God the Father in the Old Testament that was patient and enduring and steadfast even when his people were disobedient. You've shown us in your holy word what it's like to be in, 
be in your family and what it means to follow you and to grow in your love, grow in our love for you. Some of us here, maybe we've not taken that step to be in your family. I pray that your Holy Spirit in these last times is working in their hearts and drawing them to you. For those listening and those family members that aren't with us, we pray that they would see the goodness and the blessings they can enjoy in your family and that you would draw them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So at this time, we're going to pass out the, uh, the elements. If the guys want to uh, come up here, we're going to have a little instrumental music that's going to play while they pass those out. And then I'll